one of them torpedoed an Argentine cruiser outside the exclusion zone. Hermes executive officer, Commander John Locke, told the ship's company over the main broadcast. Uh, the Belgrado, the Argentinian cruiser, has been torpedoed to the south of the Falkland Islands by one of our SSNs, and in addition, as a result of a seeking surface detection to the north of the Falklands, we launched some Lynx helicopters, which carried out a successful missile attack on this particular contact. On the ships, as elsewhere in the world, there was much debate about extending the zone of conflict, and among sailors, sadness at the loss of life. But now there was a sudden change of fortune. A column of smoke on the horizon showed where HMS Sheffield, one of the Navy's most modern destroyers, was hit by an Exocet missile. One missile capable of destroying a ship. From the deck of Hermes, helicopters were scrambled to offer assistance. They were loaded up with firefighting equipment and pumps. Sheffield had no power to put out the fire that was destroying her. Doctors went too, but there was little for them to do. The few serious casualties were brought back to Hermes and rushed below to the sick bay. The escorting frigate maneuvered about us, continually putting its missiles between us and the likely attack, changing station as the direction of the threat varied. While the battle to save Sheffield went on, three Harriers took off on another bombing raid to Goose Green. Only two returned, another blow to the task force. A trickle of Sheffield crewmen continued to come aboard the flagship with minor injuries. They were dazed, but walking from the helicopters with the assistance of the medical orderlies. After five hours, the ship was abandoned to the fire. The sea was as calm as the day she was hit. The flat surface making it easy for the Argentine pilot to fly low, avoiding radar detection. The missile had been spotted just seconds before it struck. The captain of Sheffield was Sam Salt. I can tell you that uh, we're talking about seconds to react rather than minutes. And uh, I hope, I'm sure you will appreciate that uh, a missile which comes in uh, less than 12 feet off the deck at uh, very high speed, many hundreds of miles an hour, uh, gives us a very short time of response. Uh, and we saw it at a stage at which there was really no time to do anything other than uh, for those who were in the immediate vicinity of the small number of people who saw this missile appearing, only had time to, uh, to say, take cover. And we're talking about three or four seconds later, the missile striking HMS Sheffield. How much effect did it have? Uh, devastating. Uh, it hit the center of the ship, which is the center of all operation, both mechanical and detection and weapon system wise uh, about six feet above the water level uh, damaged two large compartments and when inside the ship uh, exploded and exploded outwards and upwards and uh, we're actually talking about 15 to 20 seconds, I know it sounds incredible, but 15 to 20 seconds before the whole of the working area of the ship, and I'm talking about one third of the ship, the centre portion, was filled by black, acrid, acrid, uh, pungent smoke. My overriding impression throughout the five hours that we tried to fight this damage Five hours. Five hours, uh, through which we tried to fight this damage, was of immense calm, common sense, and careful thinking by really every member of the ship's company. What was it that finally made you decide to give up that fight, to abandon the ship? I think we uh, started thinking uh, that we were on a losing wicket. 
when we realised the fire was spreading, uh, the decks were hot on the upper deck. You could feel the heat of the deck through your feet with shoes on. The superstructure was steaming. Paint on the ship's side was coming off. The area around the initial exp uh, area where the missile penetrated the hull was glowing red. It was white hot and red hot. Uh, the flames we could see coming out of the hole, the extent of damage was such that we knew that there is no way in that class of submarine, over that class of ship, that you can possibly fight that ship again with that amount of damage. It would have been useless if you'd saved it. E even even if we saved it uh, and went back on board, there is no way that that ship could positively contribute to this group. You went back later by helicopter to see it. Even then, you, you were certain you'd made the right decision to abandon. I have no doubt at all, I'm afraid. Um, we went back by helicopter about seven hours after the explosion, and the whole of the center section was a roaring mass of flame. That is the whole of the working area of the ship. It was your decision to abandon the ship? Yes, it was. How did uh, you feel when you gave that order? Awful. You'd known the ship some time? Yes. Uh, not as long as the rest of the ship's company, because I only joined it uh, abroad in January but the rest of that ship's company had been together for a long time. Uh, it's a very good ship. I'm sure every captain would say that their ship's company is the best afloat. But I certainly believe that Ca mine was. Captain, well, the... I'd just like to finish, if I could, and say that the other part of the decision to abandon was the fact that we were taking part or taking the attention of other ships and units in the area at a time when we were subject to attack. We had no hope of retrieving the fighting capability of that ship. The fire had extended to an extent that was dangerous with regard to uh, our own ammunition, magazines, and missile magazines. And the ship's company, all of them, were on the upper deck, and had been on the upper deck, in very cold conditions for five hours. We were not, lo we were not winning that fire, beating it. We were losing. Only four of the ship's company had to stay in the Hermes sick bay. They needed treatment for burns. I found them all remarkably cheerful and resilient, even the one most seriously hurt. He'd been in the same compartment as the missile when it exploded. Somehow he'd got out alive. Aboard Hermes, the lessons of the Sheffield were studied. All doors and hatches were kept closed, restricting movement about the ship, but also ensuring that fire and smoke couldn't spread after an attack. Many of the crew slept at their action stations, to speed responses further. In any case, nobody was allowed to sleep below the waterline, so for many, it was a choice of borrowing a bunk from somebody else or spreading a mattress on the floor. Two days after the loss of Sheffield, there was more bad news. Thursday, May the 6th, and another bad day for the task force. Two Harriers from Invincible have gone off in this mist, and they haven't come back. They disappeared from the radar trace simultaneously, so it looks as though they collided rather than were shot down. But that means we have now lost three Harriers since the start of the action, and that's a rate of loss which is unacceptable. More Harriers are being brought down by the RAF, but for the moment, the Harriers here on the ships are all that the Navy has available to it. But worsening weather brought clearer skies, sending the ships closer into the shore and the Harriers back in the air to squeeze the blockade tighter, harrying supply ships and aircraft, shelling Argentine positions. All part of the continuing pressure to prepare for an invasion or force Argentina to negotiate an acceptable solution.
At the end of a week of war, the reckoning in the fleet was that Argentina was paying a heavier price than Britain. Brian had the Exocet missile. An hour later, we are told that two sea harriers from HMS Invincible collided in the fog after takeoff. Both pilots are missing, presumed dead. The 8th of May, Saturday, the fog has lifted and we are allowed to overfly Sheffield. It's four days now since she was abandoned, but she refuses to sink despite the gaping hole in her side. Somewhere below, she's still burning, smoke curls out of one of the hatches distorted by the heat. Afloat and drifting with the currents, silent and gutted, a tomb for those who died inside. We have completed our first week of war and we are about to begin our sixth week at sea. And we seem constantly now in bad weather as we approach the Antarctic winter. The men of the task force have been told to prepare themselves for a long, cold winter of attrition. Michael Nicholson, ITN, with the British task force off the Falkland Islands. Now, for 263 officers and men, the ordeal is finally over. They're about to be reunited with their families, families who they haven't seen for more than six months. HMS Sheffield sailed for the Middle East in November and was about to return in early April when the Falklands crisis began and she was diverted to the South Atlantic. Cheers now for the men of Sheffield who are now disembarking at RAF Bryce Norton. They're returning from the Ascension Islands in two VC-10s. The second will be touching down at 3 o'clock this afternoon. So disembarking now are about 130 of Sheffield's company after the final part of their ordeal, a seven-hour flight back home. They've been met by Rear Admiral Robert Gherkin, the flag officer whose flotilla included HMS Sheffield. The families of the men are waiting in the terminal building, not on the tarmac. The Royal Navy are particularly concerned that after all they've been through, the families as well as the men, that their reunion should be as private as possible. Now from RAF Bryce Norton, back to the News Afternoon studio. Whatever progress may be made by Britain's land forces, they feel they've proved they still pose a very substantial threat to the Royal Navy. These pictures of HMS Sheffield underway were used on the main TV program here the day it fell victim to an Exocet missile fired from an Argentine plane. It's obviously in Argentina's interest to let it be thought they have sufficient of these missiles. Military sources here said we have about 14 left and dismissed British claims that they have just one by saying, just wait and see. You know how effective they can be. They also claim to have ship-to-ship -ship Exocets on their Class 42 destroyers. Together with defensive sea dart missiles, this would give them another powerful weapons cocktail if their fleet ever leaves the protection of inshore waters to engage the British around the fort.